Hello everyone, it's GigaBeef here and we have the patch notes for 12, 12, 30 that have been released on the Escape from Tarkov forum. So we're just gonna be going through them quickly just to see exactly what they've done. And most of this stuff I think we already know about. I had a quick scan through just before making this video. So most of it we know about already, but let's just get started. So new additions, expanded the lighthouse location, added the ability to visit the island where the lighthouse is located and also added new interiors inside the water treatment plant facility complex. Now we know that we were going to be able to visit the island but not go inside and that we're going to be able to have access to that whole area without needing something to get in. Now the different interiors inside the water treatment facility, I don't know whether this is going to be underground or whether you're going to be able to have access to the roofs or something like that but that seems like it's going to be the case. We're just going to have to explore the map and see what they've done there. Added three new bosses, the commanders of the XPMC group known as the Rogues, the leader of the gang is Knight, who coordinates the actions across the entire group and specializes in assault operations. Birdeye maintains distance between him and the enemy, setting up ambushes and choosing positions with a clear line of sight to the area. Big Pipe prefers the grenade launcher and serves the role of massive firepower in battle and always rushes towards the enemy to reach combat distance. Okay, so that's pretty much what we knew already was coming. Bosses maintain contact with each other and with other rogues, however they don't stick together and instead keep their positioning distances. When an enemy is detected by any of the bosses or rogues, information on enemy location is transmitted to everyone by radio and the bosses prepare for battle taking up tactical positions for engagement. This is going to make them an absolute pain to deal with on Lighthouse specifically. Bosses help each other, use all available weapons and are hostile to everyone, players of any faction, scavs and raiders. They don't communicate with the rest of the bosses and fence, so they attack any enemy immediately. Killing them does not affect the player's reputation, which is quite important. So you can kill them on scab, PMC, it, does, it doesn't matter. The bosses' habitats are lighthouse, shoreline, woods and customs. They do not stay in one place and instead wander through these locations all the time. If the bosses have moved to one of the maps, they will be absent on the others. There is no timetable for their movement and no one knows what the bosses are guided by when changing their location. I guess that's up to us to figure out during this patch. So yeah, as I said, if they're on shoreline, woods or customs, it's probably going to be a bit easier because there aren't, as far as we're aware at the moment, there aren't any rogues on any of these maps. On Lighthouse, if they're also communicating with the rogues too, that's going to make Lighthouse quite nightmarish. And if there's no distinction between Yusek and Bear, that actually will kind of even the playing field a little bit when the rogues are on the map because they're going to be indiscriminate whether you're Yusek or not. So next up we have adding the offline co-op mode. This is one I'm really excited about. This game mode is only available to players who purchase the Edge of Darkness pre-order edition. As I've said before, I hope that they change this to allow standard players relatively quickly, but we'll see. Added the co-op checkbox on the game mode selection screen. In the co-op mode, all settings for bots, bosses, time and weather are identical to online raids, okay? But progress in co-op raids is not saved and the gear taken into such raids won't be lost upon death. Well, that makes sense. That's exactly how offline works right now. The start as group checkbox allows for all players in the group to spawn together in the center of the location. With the checkbox unticked, all players will spawn like in the online mode. Fine. The number of players in a group for the co-op mode has been increased and depends upon the maximum number of players in the selected location. So I guess you can go in and just absolutely fill out a lobby with you know, 15, 16, however many is the, the maximum if you're playing on a big map. On Factory, you're probably still going to be stuck with you know, five or, or six or something, depending on whether you're playing night or day, whatever the maximum is for that particular map. The number of co-op servers may be limited under heavy loads. In this case, on the group gathering screen, you'll see a message saying, attention, high load on the practice mode servers. This message means that finding a server for a co-op raid may take longer than usual. So I guess this is fair enough. If the servers are under load, they need to take priority for the actual real raids that are happening and not people's co-op raids. So I think that's totally fine. Next up, reworked the movement animations, updated the animations for character movement, jumps and stances, added new breathing animations, melee attack animations, weapon drawing and holstering. We're going to have to see how this feels. We saw some of the precursors to this in the Tarkov TV and they have teased some of the animations and they look really good, but we're just going to have to see how it actually feels in the game because that's really what makes the difference and whether there's some kind of weird behavior in that kind of thing. You only find that out when you actually play. Added sprint animations that change depending on the weapon type rifle, pistol, melee, grenade, and its length. As we saw, they've got different animations for different slot sizes of weapons, seems to be how it's working. Added rotations and tilts of the body when moving and sprinting. The lower the speed and position of the player, the lower the tilt of the body during turns and vice versa. Pretty cool. Implemented weapon operations during the sprint, in particular the ability to switch to another gun, switch your fire mode, check the magazine or chamber, folding and unfolding inspection and reloading whilst you're sprinting. I mean, you can always 
At the moment, sprint and reload. So you can, so long as you start the reload before you sprint, you can carry on reloading while you do so. But this seems to be that during a sprint, you're able to start reloading as well. So it's just some tightening up of these mechanics. We're going to see how that plays out. Fixed third person weapon twisting whilst prone lying on the side. That super lean is kind of notoriously buggy. So we'll have to see if that feels a little bit better. Often it's actually quite hard to use the scope if you've got one on when you're on the side. So it kind of limits its use most of the time unless the area is perfectly flat. So we'll see how that feels. Adding daily tasks for player scavs. The tasks will be given out by Fence once a day and will be available after building the Intelligence Center in the hideout, regardless of PMC character level. So you have to get to Intelligence Center 1 to get the Fence tasks for player scavs. It doesn't say anything here about whether that's going to give you PMC experience. I imagine it probably will because it's not really that valuable having experience on your scav, but we'll see. Added a new type of daily tasks, searching for items from a category such as food, medicine, weapons, etc. All items will need to be found in one raid. Well, this just makes the scav junk box and hoarding finding raid items even more useful than it was before. Added slots for special items in the PMC inventory, into which you can put a compass, a rangefinder, a Wi Fi camera, a marker, and other special items. Items in special slots are not lost upon death. They also cannot be looted from bodies. To activate an item for a special slot, you need to assign a key. So this is going to be useful for doing those quests. Some of them you need like four markers, so you're still not going to be able to put all of them inside those slots because you're probably going to have three like they showed on the Tarkov TV cast. So you're still not going to be able to take in four for doing some of the proper marking tanks, but it helps a little bit. It means you only need to put one in your secure container rather than four. You don't have to give up quite as much stuff, especially if you're playing on standard. Added a flare gun and single shot reactive flare rounds with lighting and flare ammo. Shooting red signal flares will call in a plane with an airdrop to fly to the nearest possible location. Updated the airdrop mechanics, added four types of containers with unique contents, weapons, medicine, supplies, and general purpose. Added countermeasure flares when flying in and dropping in the container. I guess it's just going to be cosmetic so that it looks cool. Updated the plane flying trajectories and decreased the engine sound volume. That is an absolute lifesaver. The airdrops right now are extremely loud and there's no way to turn them down outside of just putting an alt in on or something or taking your headset off. So this is very, very welcome. Often these sounds in the game come in too loud, the hideout, the rain, and then the airdrops. So I'm really glad that they've taken that feedback and decreased it. So next, added tasks for the new lighthouse territories. This is just gonna be more quests, I imagine. Then we've got updated the base closing models for USEC and Bear PMCs, so a little bit of a different design. We'll see what that looks like. New head models for USECs and Bears as well. Then we have the new weapons. I think we've pretty much seen all of these tees before. The Vanelli M3 shotgun, Accuracy International AXMC, which I think is one that people are most looking forward to because that's a 338 Lapua sniper, Bolti, which allows you to complete the Tarkov shooter quest line. The MP or MR18 single shot rifle, which is going to be break action. That one's kind of a little bit memey. The RD704 assault rifle, SAG AK carbine. We're going to have to see how these actually play out in terms of their recoil and that kind of thing. The G36 assault rifle series would be kind of fun. It depends what they do to 556, if we feel like 556 has been improved somewhat. And the grenade launcher, which I imagine, I think this must be Big Pipe's grenade launcher, the MGL M32A1. Yeah, the revolver grenade launcher is the one that fires multiple shots, and we saw teased on Tarkov TV as well. Also, they've reworked the animations for the 133 and the MP9, which is intriguing. I wonder if that'll make a big difference. And also we have a new model, animations and some more mods for the SV-98. Looking forward to seeing that because as we saw, the SV-98 is one of the most accurate, assuming the stats stay through this patch, is the most accurate sniper rifle that you can get suppressed. So that could be kind of cool, making it even more economic and even better than it is already. I did new equipment and items. We don't know what this means yet. We're going to have to see when we get into the raids. The one gun that is missing at the moment is the AUG. People thought the AUG might be added. It's not in this list. Maybe it's still there, but we haven't seen it yet. And it's kind of part of this. And it's there for us to discover. We will see. Then we have changed the bonuses for the perception skill. Now the hearing radius increases by 0.3 per level up until 15% for the max level. What this 15% exactly means is always kind of in question. But before this change, the hearing radius increased by 0.7% and up to 35%. So this is a big decrease in perception skill in general. Lots of people were thinking that this should be nerfed. So I think this is good. To be honest, they may as well just get rid of the skill in my opinion, but whatever, it is what it is. Change the inertia speed and force when leaning. This is gonna stop the quick peaking, ideally. We will see there's still a quite a lot of quick peaking meta going on in Tarkov. So hopefully this, this works out in a good way for that. New outfits for both PMC factions. Okay, new crafting recipes in the hideout. Okay, we're just gonna have to investigate what those mean when the wipe comes through. 
Reworked Elite Metabolism Skill. Now with zero hydration and energy, you will not receive any thirst and hunger damage, but you'll still receive the other negative effects. Before this change, there were no negative effects at all. So this means that you're gonna be exhausted, that you can't get your stamina back up, that kind of thing. Previously with Elite Metabolism, it basically didn't matter to you at all. It didn't make any difference. So the only thing that you're not gonna take is the damage, which is a significant part of the thirst and hunger effects, but now it's slightly more punitive on those that do have elite metabolism. And finally, in the main section, we have reworked the elite strength skill. Now weapons that are equipped on the sling, on the back, and in the holster. This is basically all your guns. So weapon in the sling, weapon on your back, pistol in the holster. Those become weightless. All other equipment and items in the chest rigs, backpacks, pouches, secure container, it's counted normally. Before this change, all equipment and weapons were weightless. This is a massive massive nerf to elite strength. This is a huge nerf to elite strength because players could wear any armor they wanted, any rigs, and any any stuff in any of those rigs as well also didn't count. And it was crazy because players weighed almost nothing. So having elite strength means they've also got elite endurance pretty much exclusively. And that also means that then inertia really doesn't affect them at all. So this is quite a big difference. You'll still be able to go overweight a lot quicker if you're picking up a lot of loot with elite strength. And it's probably a good change. Right, the next section we have graphical improvements. We've added FSR, so those who don't have NVIDIA cards potentially can use FSR instead of DLSS. I'm not gonna go into this because lots of other people have spoken about it, but this has been added. They've temporarily disabled MIP streaming because they're basically saying they're reworking it. And they've updated NVIDIA Reflex, which is, which is kind of cool. Maybe it'll work slightly better than it does now. I know a few people have had some bugs with NVIDIA Reflex. It works pretty well for me, but some people have had some bugs, so hopefully that reduces that. Now, reworked laser sights for all tactical devices. This is the update that a lot of people were looking for for night raids and for infrared and for MVGs, which is really cool. So with IR mode enabled, lasers and flashlights will not be visible since they're used for MVGs. This is the IR lasers. So you won't be able to see the IR flashlight anymore. You could just about see it previously. Um, not that you could see the IR lasers, but anyway, you can only see them using the MVGs now, which is going to be really, really cool. Also, the intensity and brightness of standard non-IR lasers has been increased, so it makes it a little bit easier to see them. Not sure if this is necessarily that good, because you could see some of the red and blue lasers and, and green pretty easily, to be honest. We're going to have to see how that plays out. I'm not sure if that was necessarily required, but the fact that you can now see the IR flashlight and the IR lasers with the MVGs is going to be super, super cool. It's going to make it feel a lot more tactical when you go into those night raids. It might even make me play it, you know. I don't really play night raids, but I think this is a really awesome update. I think this is great. Sounds. New voice of a bear in USEC, okay. New sounds of movement on top of various surface types. This is kind of cool. Hopefully this is gonna make the sounds a little bit more nuanced. I know at the moment you step on a, a log outside of woods and it sounds like you're stepping on floorboards, that kind of weird stuff. So maybe that kind of thing is fixed. New sounds for weapons dropping on various surfaces, kind of fun. We saw in Tarkov TV, they dropped a, a pistol, I think it was, on top of a manhole cover and it made the sort of metal clonking sound. Just adding a little bit more immersion to the game and added the sounds of bodies collapsing after death and the sounds of transition prone. Interesting. Maybe this will make it more easy to hear whether you've actually killed someone or not, as well as the sound effect that the PMCs make themselves when they die. We will see. Right, then we have the list of fixes. This is actually pretty long. Um, I don't think there's... Not not all of them are really that critical. Sound effects of headsets no longer persist between offline raids. Fine. Added a perk icon for hand stamina to the endurance skill. Okay. Cultist knives. Value no longer resets to max if the knife is picked up from a player. This is like some various bugs here, right? Display fixes of prices, if there's five characters or more. Adding the sorting table to the mail and the task reward screens is really good. So this basically means that when you're getting stuff back from insurance, you can use the sorting table, which is really cool. Task reward screens, you don't normally get that many items, so it's not a problem. But mail does mean insurance, which is really, really cool. That's actually a really good one. Projectile with the AGS projectile, no longer changes when the scope is moved, fine. Metal bars on labs, no longer reduce damage, okay. Incorrect behavior of bodies, fine. The next button no longer disappears when you're going through the faction select screen, okay. MS200, MS2000 marker, bug fixes. Uh, a couple of window fixes, full screen and 1920 by 1080 in windowed mode. Helmet mounted flashlight no longer blocks vision when using stationary weapons. Very specific, not one that I've ever run in into. <laughs> Picking up an item whilst prone no longer causes incorrect camera movement. Adjusted the aiming accuracy for the TOS KS23 carbine. So this is the issue where the TOS shoots really low when using any of the buckshot rounds. It's very, very weird bug. It keeps reappearing in the game. We'll see what that looks like. Maybe the TOS is, is back good again. It's locked behind quite a lot of trader stuff, so it's not really that well used anymore, but it might make it a bit easier to use when you do finally get access to that. Fixed a bug that causes rogues to visually appear incorrectly behind stationary weapons. Nice. Sword direction indicator is no longer changed in position if the player re-enters the flea market screen. Fine. 
This one I thought was really weird. The FN Scar H762 by 51, 20 round magazine, now increases the weapon's size by one slot down. So the Scar H is already two slots. So this is going to make it a three slot wide weapon. Not really sure why this is necessary. Maybe it's because the Scar is such a tall gun anyway and so it's two slots tall by itself and then with the 20 round mag adds another one slot don't know why they felt this was necessary this doesn't really do anything outside of being slightly annoying inside the hideout because when you've got it in your hands it doesn't matter how big it is so it's only for looting purposes you'll need to take the magazine out if you take somebody else's and it's not in on your back when changing the menu background while in the hideout the hideout image is no longer overlapped by the menu background fine icon trooper low graphic settings okay some anti-aliasing for items, a bug that causes character textures to become distorted, incorrect patrol route for Tagila on Nighttime Factory. I don't play Nighttime Factory particularly, so I'm not sure exactly what this is. I guess he was ending up in some random places. Lack of wet asphalt effect with SSR enabled in some places on Lighthouse. Fine. Added inertia when quickly tapping the A and D keys. So what I think this is, what normally if you hold A, you let go and you press D, you move direction in strafing much, much faster than you um, than you would otherwise if you held A and then held D afterwards. You get this like really long sway on. It seems like they've removed that. So now you're going to have the really long sway no matter what, no matter which way you do it, which is good. I mean, it's, it's something that's been flagged up by quite a lot of people. Fixed bot behavior when shooting with revolvers. Okay. Weapon stat penalties from ammo are now displayed correctly for revolvers. This is interesting because I noticed this when I was doing my accuracy guide that on revolvers, especially like the shotgun, you can't see what the MOA difference is or the accuracy if you're adding slugs into the revolver because the magazine, I guess, wasn't picking up in the weapon stats or something. This is a very, very small minor issue, but it's good that it's been fixed. Fixed incorrect behavior of Tagillet when changing positions during combat. Presumably this means him just running around constantly because he does do a lot of that and not actually shooting at the player or even running out of the player. He's just like moving around a lot and just allows you to kill him, which is a bit weird. Killer is no longer hostile to player scouts with a reputation above six. This is cool. This means you can be able to go and hang out with Tagilla if you manage to get max scav reputation and just go around interchange killing PMCs with him, which is quite fun. Just fix the display of weapons in the folded and unfolded state. I think there was only a couple of these that had some real problems. I know that the T5000, the Orsis, had some issues with this where you couldn't see whether it was folded or not. That was kind of irritating. So that's good that that's fixed. Fix the possibility of bot hands getting frozen. Okay. Rogues are now aggressive again towards USIC players who killed them in past raids. I did wonder this because often I found that even if I'd been into a raid before on Lighthouse, they weren't aggroing me again. I wasn't really sure whether this was a bug or not, but it seems like it was. So now they're going to be very aggro towards us for, I guess, like you know, two or three raids or something if we're shooting at rogues. Fix a number of issues related to the calculation of inertia, allowing players to bypass or reduce it. Okay, so more of the stuff that we heard before. The other ones that we saw further up are kind of the main obvious ones, but there may be some other small cases as well. Fixed an error that caused the disappearance of ammo loaded into magazines during a raid after finishing it. I've never had this one. I've seen people on Twitter talking about it. Fixed blocking of inventory operations that could occur after selecting a weapon picked up from a killed scav. Okay. <laughs> Fixed a bug during which, due to which the container from the airdrop froze in the air. Okay, weird. And fixed an overly bright lighting of characters when loading into a location. So that's it, guys. That's absolutely everything in here. There's actually not that much stuff that we didn't know already. We're going to see when we actually get into it exactly what any of this means. I think the new animations, we're going to have to test that out quite a lot. Combining all of the different operations across all the different guns with all the different stances, all the different lengths of weapons, there's definitely going to be some weird stuff in there. So send your stuff through to the, the bug reporter if you find anything weird. And have a happy wipe. I hope you guys have a good time this patch with lots of progression. I'm going to be making a ton of videos about various aspects of the game and really pushing it this wipe. So hope you all have a good one and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.